I've spent most of my lifetime trying personally and collectively to figure out a way to bring all the many different fragments of my, of our existence into a unified, pluralistic whole. And I'm finally in a space that allows for this, a time when, as a woman and as an African, I have the power to define my own narrative and place in the world. I feel it all across the continent and in the diaspora in others' relations to us, we are entering, or have entered, a new time, a new era. And we have the tools, the languages, the voices to define it for ourselves. There are many that are still not in this position of freedom, and I feel like it's our collective responsibility to ensure that as many as possible have the privilege of the freedom to create themselves in the world. My question today is, how do we do that? How do we begin to describe or define this moment that we're entering or have entered, and then make it as open as possible for as many as possible to enter or to pass through? And then, where do we go from here? I want to talk a little bit about how I got to where I am, to this feeling, even though it's in no way an end point. If anything, it's just a beginning. So. I grew up between three worlds, Ghana, Germany, and the UK. Ostensibly, I grew up speaking three languages fluently, but really I felt I spoke none of them well enough, that I was not whole in any of these languages. Those that know me now might be surprised to hear that I was a very quiet child, shy and watchful. And as I moved from school to school and country to country, found that nothing quite came out right. I remember when I was about six, and on top of German and Shui, I had just started or had learned English. And I was trying to tell my mother and her friend at my mother's English friend's house that I wanted a drink. Um, both my faces and my insides started burning up as they started laughing seemingly interminably at me as I said this. Um, until stopping for breath, my mother's friend repeated what she thought I had said. She wants to think. My tongue had stumbled on all these many different worlds and these many different words that I had to inhabit, and none of them felt fully like mine. That time and many times throughout my childhood, throughout my early teens, I'd bite down on my tongue. It was seemingly involuntarily, but it was so often as to render it chronic until blood would fill my mouth. But with time, I became vociferous and boisterous and outwardly confident, loud even, because I was mimicking closely the behavior, the actions, the tones, and the rhythms of those girls that did not seem to have to second guess who they were, how they fitted into the world, both to themselves and to the external world, who seemed to live with ease, and who in daily life succeeded and did not, like me, seem constantly to be drowning. My mother, on the other hand, did not seem to doubt herself. She was full of the seemingly endless self-love. And it was in everything. It was in the way she moved, the way she laughed, the way she danced, the way she spoke. It shone right out of her. So that even if I did not feel home, I did not, like some of my other friends, feel inferior to those Europeans around me. And as a girl, and later as a young woman, I inherited from her this expansiveness of the feeling that if I pushed and if I worked hard enough, I could create and be anything I wanted to in this world. And yet, there was something lacking at my core. I was embarrassed by my clumsy approximations of my mother tongue, of chui, of when I danced the adawa or tried to make the many different foods, which all of which came to my mother with such ease. I understood that she and they um, wanted me to master these new gods, as when, having not been powerful enough to withstand them. And when I asked, they spoke to each other above my head, as if knowing something that I did not, um, saying, such a small girl, so many big questions. 
But this was, this was not just my burden. It was also the burden of those who lived and grew up in Accra and Kumasi and even in my hometown, Chebi. I studied Russian at university along with politics because in the literature of Matova and Tolstoy, I found something of myself in the character's search for the Russian soul, its layeredness, its depth. In the politics of the Russian Revolution, um, something of, I found something of the idealistic and philosophical attempt to reach beyond oppression as something more equitable. And in the films of Tarkovsky, I found something of the attempt to encapsulate something unseen, something intangible, of which my mother spoke so often, but which to me seemed so elusive. I was really lucky that I studied in a place and at a time when higher education was free. And so I had the privilege of experimenting, of studying into my passion. And after having repeatedly been asked by my mother, why is an African girl studying Russian? What for? Why not French, at least? I went to live in Russia. <laughs> and there, with the student's day pass, I would go daily to the Hermitage, what used to be the Winter Palace, but had become the second largest museum in the world, an encyclopedic museum, with everything from Greek antiquities to Picasso. Yet when I looked for the works from my continent, from Africa, all I could see were these ubiquitous masks, devoid of any context, of any description, of any depth. Like me before, these masks seemed like they had been rendered voiceless, like they were biting their stories into themselves, disconnected from their context. And I wondered if and how I might be able to give them voice. After working briefly with the Eastern European Department at United Nations in New York, I embarked on a master's in African art history. But even here, all the terms and phrases used to describe the works were couched in, in, in these Western philosophies, hermeneutics, phenomenology, semiotics. And I wondered, what were the descriptions of these things on their own terms in the context of their creation? So I began more in-depth research in the form of a PhD, and I found one form that I became fascinated with, the Ayan, which is a language spoken on the drum which was not only full of history and philosophy and poetics, but it connected me to my great-grandfather and to my uncle, who were both Odumon Komatrima, divine drummers and court historians. They were keepers of histories and philosophies. And when I asked my uncle if I might too be one, he said, no, <laughs> um, because I was a woman. Um, I found out with time, and he wouldn't tell me why, but I found out with time it's because I, as a woman, bleed, and my blood is more powerful than the blood of the animals that they use to sacralize the drums. But still, I persisted. And after three years, and having had to sacrifice a sheep to open the doors, I learned more. So in Ghana for my field research, I started to find that every time I wanted to travel to my hometown, something would happen. You know, the t something could happen to the car, my lift, something. And I found out that it was my mum that was behind all of these accidents <laughs> stopping me from going home. She was trying to protect me because, she, like, like she said, everyone that dug into these kinds of things, something would happen to them. The implication being that there was something rotten at the very core of our own roots. And still, I kept digging. And when I found academia too two-dimensional for this kind of multi-storied musical form of storytelling, I turned to film and began to make films. When I found film too constrained for this layeredness of stories that I was experiencing and imagining, I started writing fiction. And when I found there was a need for this platform of all the pluralities and voices and narratives I came across, I started the Cultural Encyclopedia, which in a way was trying to undo this hierarchic and dogmatic form of the encyclopedia and turn it on its head. And when I found that there was a need for a physical space in which we could all come together, which was not an African, which was not a foreign cultural institution in Africa, I, I founded the Anno Institute of Arts and Knowledge in Accra. And when the idea of this metropolitan cultural space became too insular and inward looking, I created a mobile museum that went into communities um, for cultural exchange and exploration. 
And then when I found that these conversations would benefit from a bigger, from a national scale, I fought to help shape the direction of a new museum that we're creating from a castle in Accra. My dream is that this museum will not be a place like Western ones who are just now beginning to reckon with the hypocrisy of having devalued our culture to us, whilst at the same time collecting and adding, adding value to it for themselves. My hope is that this place will not be a place where objects go to die and be deanimated, but in instead a place of activation, of healing, of dynamism, and of communion, where the many fragmented foundations of our industrialized world, of Africa, its diasporas, and the West can come together in an honest exchange, and where out of one shared painful past we can create pluralistic, symbiotic presence. What will an institution, a space, look like that reflects, that resonates, that represents us? Over the last months, I've traveled the 10 regions of Ghana, talking to fishermen, artists, kenke sellers, kente weavers, farmers, monks, malams, or software professors, um, school children, kings, all kinds of people, asking them, what is culture to you? What obstacles do you face in your daily lives? Can culture play any part in mediating or helping you to overcome these? And how would you like to see that culture expressed and resonated? In what kinds of structures? And do you feel that culture can connect you in any way? The last people I spoke to were two artists, musicians, and knowledge keepers. Knowledge keepers is their term. I would have called them traditional priests. Others would have called them fetish priests, a term that's used to denigrate our traditional religion. What I learned from them is that we didn't have religions. We had what they called knowledge systems. And then they went deeper and they told me that the knowledge system that they were keepers of was made up of seven hermetic schools, which encompassed science and technology and the knowledge of the mind and the knowledge of the soul and political systems and much more. And then they told me that each of these seven schools had six components, which, which comprised of mathematics and mythology and the arts and much more. They told me that this system helped us to understand, in our own way, the mechanisms of existence, and that they were thus a form of science and could help us with the needs of this earth and of our environment. I'm now working on a curriculum out of this knowledge system that I'm learning to complement the existing ones that we have, which, if it succeeds at home and in other places abroad, will begin to establish a sense of this wholeness that I and many others have been looking for. I've finally begun to come full circle from a sense of this empty fragmentation to one of wholeness and fullness, from a voicelessness to a multilingual, multi-layered expression, and from a museum in a former palace to one in a former castle, but this time not in a place of helplessness, but in a place where I can actually affect change. I have fought for this seat at the table. <coughs> at which, at different times, I've been told that I'm too young, too female, too African to sit. But I'm here, and I'm face to face with anyone from anywhere in the world, and I am equal. And the table is no longer just in Berlin, but it's in Accra, it's in Dakar, it's in Addis Ababa, it's in Nairobi, it's in Johannesburg, it's in Luanda, it's in Marrakesh, it's in Khartoum, it's in Salvador. And I'm not there alone, but there's so many others there too. And they're called things like David, and Tai, and Felwin, and Afwa, and D Diego, and Wangechi, and, and so many more. This room where we all sit is one that's full of possibility. And there are possibilities that we've not yet named, but we've breathed, we've borne them into existence. And they and it frees us of our past, and its resonance will soon be felt right across the world. I'm sure of that. Every culture has its ways of understanding, of mediating the world. In our case, these ways were, were denigrated to the extent that we internalize that denigration. Did the generation before us try to undo that process in reaction to what came before? We now no longer have to react. 
We, don't, we do not live in a post-anything moment. We are on the frontiers of a new horizon in which we can look with curiosity and with passion at what came before, and we can use all the tools of, at our disposal to uncover, to articulate, to mediate, and resonate what we find and where we stand right now.